Mark 8. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus calls his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. And they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Damanutha. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the years of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread? Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see? Ears but fail to hear. And don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. He said to them, Do you still not understand? Good morning. Before I speak, I just want to do a very short prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, set up your kingdom in our midst. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us sinners. Holy Spirit, breath of God, Renew us and all the world. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a pleasure to be back with you again. So I guess the first thing to just share with you is that back in March this year, I stepped down from my role as pastor or co-pastor at Frampton Park Baptist Church. The passage that we are looking at today gives me a great opportunity to reveal that which God has laid on my heart and where I believe he's calling me to serve him next because it's about him. Amen? But let's start by considering Jesus' warning because that was the title, the leaven of the Pharisees, which was given to me. Let's start by considering Jesus' warning to his disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees. Those of you, I'm sure many of you will know this, that leaven is yeast. It's, it's used uh, in dough to make it rise. The Jews used leaven when they were making when they were baking bread, but at Passover it's forbidden to be used. And the reason being is because when they fled from Egypt, they didn't have time to put leaven in their bread, so they had unleavened bread. And ever since then, that's become the custom. At Passover, you must not use leaven in your bread. But Jesus speaks of leaven, not to warn the disciples about the wrong type of bread, 
This is where the frustration of Jesus you can hear at times. It's not to warn them about the wrong type of bread, no. But to put them on guard about the wrong type of kingdom vision. That's what's going on in this passage. Because the the Pharisees were diluting it. They were diluting the vision. They wanted God to set up a kingdom for the benefit of the Jews, and not just the Jews, but those who can observe the law with great strictness. Not for the wider company who Jesus had in mind, i.e. the likes of you and I. And then Herod also gets a mention. He never ever gets a mention in the good light, does he, Herod, (laughs) in the Gospels. But Herod and his entourage, they're diluting the vision too. Because they want God to establish a royal family, their royal family, as the true kings of Israel. So both the Pharisees and Herod had their own agendas in mind. That's the problem. And the disciples are being warned of the same thing. Be careful. I find, I, I really, seriously, when you read scripture, sometimes you laugh, but then you think, well, I, that's me as well. I find it really comical that the Pharisees are asking Jesus to give them a sign from heaven. Really? Really? I mean, two chapters before in Mark, we learn about the feeding of the 5,000. Yes, with five loaves and two fish. This chapter, the feeding of the 4,000, with seven loaves and a few fish. Now, before all of this, we learn that Jesus cast out unclean spirits, healed Peter's mother-in-law, healed a paralyzed man, healed a man with a withered hand, calmed the storm, and rose Jairus' daughter from the dead. And you need more evidence? You need more evidence from heaven. I think it's safe to assume that the Pharisees were aware of at least some of these miracles, if not all. In other words, these heavenly happenings which they're asking Jesus to give them more signs of. It's comical. They don't need any further signs. They really don't need any further miracles. What they need is a new heart. And the solution to their problem was standing right before their very eyes. But they were, guess what? Blinded by their own agendas. This is really what is going on. Jesus, through all his miracles, and this is a key part of the miracles, he had made it very clear that he is the Jewish Messiah they've been waiting for. He made it very clear. I've arrived. This is what he was saying. This is really the thrust of what he was saying. Throughout the gospel, I mean, we studied the gospel of Mark as a small group. It's a great gospel. It's so fast-paced. And again, there's lots of comical moments when you think, you know, asking yourself, how come you don't get this, disciples? But then I have to always turn the finger back at myself. (laughs) Do I always get it? I'm still working this stuff out. Because there's a difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge, yes? So we're still working it out. The Pharisees and Herod, they were determined not to hear the message Jesus had come to announce. They were determined to continue to struggle for the kingdom on their terms rather than his. That is what was going on. The clash of kingdom visions, which resulted in the crucifixion of Jesus when the forces of evil manifested through human beings like us crucified him. But we know and praise God for the great victory that was accomplished in that crucifixion. Because in that moment, all of those dark forces which converged at the cross to kill him, to crucify him, Jesus had overcome, he had conquered the power of darkness. Amen? So the crucifixion was of great victory. The back end of last year, I was introduced to an international discipleship ministry. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's in 70 countries, Asia, Africa, uh, the US, Europe, uh, and yeah, hopefully England as well, uh, or the UK. 
And I was introduced to the founder. I don't know if Paul knows him, a gentleman called Dennis Pethers. So I believe he was the first ordained Baptist evangelist. He's also been a minister of a church. The chair of, that, of, the, of the actual ministry is Stephen Gork Rogers. I don't know if you know him. But he was once the uh, Baptist Union president, I believe, for, for about a year. And had a very big flourishing church as well. So they've got behind this ministry. And I was introduced to Dennis. And I'll never forget it. I was in the prayer room at Frampton. We had a, a, about, you know, a good long meeting with another minister as well called Paul Grinney who connected us both. And I have to be honest and say that when that meeting was over, I was extremely challenged. Very challenged. And I left that meeting because we have to be honest and sincere when we are convicted, yeah? This is how we make progress. I left that meeting asking some serious questions about our current practices when it comes to discipleship. You see, because this, the main focus of the rooftop is this, to train and equip churches, church leaders, to make disciples who make disciples. Yeah? With the key emphasis, which is also the key emphasis of today's passage, to join Jesus in his mission. Yes? To join Jesus in his mission. That is the main focus of this discipleship process, the rooftop discipleship process. You see, the problem with the Pharisees and Herod is that they wanted God to join their mission. And church, I have to be honest and say this. The reason why I felt challenged when meeting Dennis was because I soon became aware that the established church is running the risk of doing likewise. Of doing likewise. And here's why. Because our primary focus, and bearing in mind I've been a church leader for 14 years, so when I'm saying this, I'm saying this to me, as well as everybody else. The primary focus is to get bums on the seats. To get people coming into our church buildings. To become part of our clan. And then when they're part of our clan, thumbs up. Yeah? Yeah? Because they've now got their ticket to go to heaven. That is what I've been part of. And that's what I see taking place. Now I have to say, I don't believe, and I've had plenty of time now to really contemplate and work through this stuff. And it was triggered by my, by my meeting with Dennis, yes. But I don't believe that Jesus ever had a building or an institution in mind when it came to him establishing his church. I believe he had people in mind. I believe he had people in mind. The church is the body of Christ. This is what the church is. And it's a movement. We should be continually on the move, not static. Sure, it's fine for us to gather together in buildings or in homes. It's absolutely, in fact, we should be doing that. It's fine for us to do that. But God's kingdom, brothers and sisters, is far greater than a cluster of buildings. We've been singing it today. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to him. This is why I'm saying some dots have been joined up even before I've stepped up here to share this message. You see, look, don't get me wrong, Jesus himself, he worshipped in the temple. He was a devout Jew. He went and spoke in temples as well, yes. He was a devout Jew. But guess what? The new temple, heaven and earth coming together, comes together in him. This is the meeting point. Heaven and earth come together in him. He is the new temple. Not the temple which Solomon built. It's Jesus Christ. He's the body. Please do not misunderstand me, and I will just quickly put this in there. The roof's top mission is not to discourage people from coming to their place of worship. Anything but that. Okay, we strongly advocate that you continue to be part of your local body and come on a Sunday and worship God and be part of your small group. That is not it. 
its primary aim is to support churches. It helps churches equip them and to train them to make disciples who make disciples. To help churches to refocus a bit when it comes to discipleship. And the main focus is for us, the body of Christ, to join Jesus in his mission. That is our, that is our focus, brothers and sisters, yeah? This is what we should be living for. To join Jesus in his mission, which, which is beyond the walls of the church. Our church should really be a base where we gather on a Sunday, okay, and we celebrate and get excited about the things that we've witnessed God doing, Jesus doing, out there, in our communities, in our places of employment, in our schools, in the supermarket, on the streets, on the tube, because God is everywhere. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So that's what we should be doing. We should be coming back and all be excited and share stories, etc. You know, of, wow, did you know what God did this week? See when that mic was going around earlier, there should have been loads of testimonies. And I, for one, was struggling to find something. You know, I'm a bit like a doctor. They're, they're, they're good at advising and giving medicine, but not good, too good at taking it themselves. Because I've got, also got the same problem, so I'm, not, I'm definitely not here to say, look at me and look at you. We're all part of the problem, but I am here to... Be convicted and to share my conviction and burden with you. I am. It should be a base where we come together and we get equipped and we basically encourage one another and we pray with one another and then we go back out there to see what Christ is doing in, in the community and beyond the walls of our church. And we should be out, go out there and we should be doing what Jesus has called us to do, which is the Great Commission, Yes. We, we must never forget this, brothers and sisters, yeah? Jesus told us, didn't he, to go out and make disciples. Who make disciples. Who make disciples. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. The rooftop gets its name from the book of Acts. You remember chapter 10 in the book of Acts when Peter is praying on the roof? And... He has this sheet come down and there's three times God's challenging Peter. He's challenging his mindset about this unclean food which has never passed Peter's lips. And he's pushing back on God and God's basically saying, what, what I make clean, Peter, who are you to say is unclean? Really what's going on here, God is basically challenging Peter's heart. Which I believe he's trying to, wants, wants to do with all of us, the, the established church. He's challenging Peter's heart. He's saying, Peter, no, 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 no. You've got this wrong. I'm not just the God of the Jews. I'm the God of the Gentiles too. All who are non-Jew, you're going to have to change your thinking. You're going to have to change your kingdom vision and align it with mine. You see, because the first nine chapters in the book of Acts, it's Jewish converts sharing the good news with fellow Jews. That's what's going on. And it was time for change. It was time for a radical change. God was saying to Peter, no, no. Remember all the way back, the first patriarch, Abraham? I said, through your offspring, all nations will be blessed. And that included Gentiles, the non-Jews. Peter encountered God he was radically changed and challenged and he was praying at the time and then he moved out of his comfort zone to Cornelius as God instructed him to do, a Gentile soldier. Now here's a stat and it kind of ties, and this is the bit which ties in with what Paul was saying. Do you know in a recent census, it was actually in 2021, you know we have these 10 year censuses, in 2021, less than half the population for the first time described themselves as Christian. A 13.1% decrease. Guess what? The second most common answer was one of no religion. A 12% increase since 2011. Now, I don't know about you, when I, when I read this and when I contemplated it, it saddened me. It really did. It saddened me, and it should sadden you. It should sadden the whole church. 
that Christianity is in decline in the UK. And you know what really troubles me? Is we, you and I, we really claim, and I wholeheartedly believe, that we have the truth in Jesus Christ. I really believe this, and I, and I, know, I know you do. Because the same spirit is living inside you, is living inside me. And not just that, but we have the power of the Holy Spirit. So we've got the truth, and we've got the power of the Holy Spirit. But yet Christianity is in decline in the UK. Friends, something's not right. It's not adding up, is it? Something needs to change. Something needs to change. And as uncomfortable as this may be, perhaps we are falling into the same trap that Jesus warned his disciples about. Be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. In other words, join me in my mission. And what is his mission? To seek and save the lost. Which is over, according to the stats which I've just quoted, over 50% of our nation. They're lost. It's either I'm misreading scriptures or misunderstanding it, or they really are lost. Because they don't know the truth, which is Jesus. We're called to be reconciliators, to reconcile humanity with God, our creator, and in that process, help to restore the image of God. That's what this is about. Restore the image of God in humanity. And it starts with this, brothers and sisters. Aligning our hearts with Jesus. Something the Pharisees and Herod were not prepared to do. That's what we have to do. Align our hearts with Jesus. And in scriptures it makes it very clear. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Luke 19 verse 10. In fact, Jesus' manifesto, which is in Luke 4, 18 to 19... What is it? To proclaim good news to the poor. Help those who are imprisoned, blind, oppressed, in debt. This is his manifesto. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, if not all of you. And this isn't just in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. It's a duality. So in other words, yes, we're called to help those who are literally imprisoned. Yeah? Yeah? Showing God's love and mercy. In fact, a lot of people actually have been converted to Christianity when being in prison, including one of my closest friends who passed away and had the discomfort of leading his funeral uh, last year. This is his manifesto. This is what Jesus is about. This is what Jesus' mission is about. The body of Christ i.e. us moving beyond the walls of our church buildings because the true followers of Christ are part of a movement, his movement, to transform humanity. This should be our ambition. This is what we should be desiring. Yeah? Transform humanity. So where is all of this going? Well, I believe we need to align our hearts with Jesus and join him in his kingdom mission which is to seek and save the lost there's some other pointers other than the east of the pharisees which the title was that was given to me uh, that can help us in this passage okay the first thing is to point out that ultimately this is a passage about discipleship this is what this is about if you just journey through the gospel of mark you'll see that jesus is spending so much time with great urgency wanting his disciples to get it Come on, guys, get it. That's what he's saying. Wake up, look, look. You know, and you can hear sometimes he gets a bit impatient. He's thinking, have you, do you still not get this? But this is what this is all about. Why? Because he knew he was going to ascend to heaven and the body of Christ, his disciples, were going to have to take, take on the role of basically seeing the transformation plan through on earth. So it's, it's about discipleship. And Jesus is showing his followers 
what the kingdom of God looks like. That's what these stories are about, and that's what the parables are about. This is what it looks like. Not your limited vision, or your, your, your own agendas that you may have. This is what it really looks like. This is what Jesus is, is doing. This is what it looks like. There's three features which jumped out. Read, when you get a chance, read the feeding of the 5,000, and you'll see there's three features which cut across both, and they jump out to me. The first is this. This was another thing which we sang about earlier. Jesus has compassion for the people. And I don't know about you, but I am so grateful for Jesus' compassion. I love when I see it being played out in other people's lives in my life. Throughout my 55 years on earth, the amount of times I have experienced the compassion of God, even whilst I've still been deep, deep, deep within sin, He's still being compassionate towards me. When others, and including myself, was a condemning me, he was trying to liberate me, to set me free. Jesus has compassion on people. The next thing is, he involves the Father through prayer. Both stories, he breaks the bread, he's a fish, and he gives thanks to the Father. And then the third point is this, he turns... And he involves the disciples. Both stories. He gives them the bread to distribute. These are three fundamentals of discipleship. A compassionate heart to the needs of others. In particular those 50% plus who are lost. Because they need to know Christ, yeah? That's where life really begins. A compassionate heart to those in need. Prayer where we're seeking the guidance and the resources of Christ and then guess what we roll up our sleeves and we get to work in our communities in our schools in our places of work in our supermarkets on the street we roll up our sleeves and we get to work that's discipleship in a nutshell all with the intention of bringing God glory we want to see him glorified yeah why would we not want to see the maker of heaven and earth who saved all of us glorified? Of course. Now there's some wonderful ministries, and I'm coming to a close. There's some wonderful ministries out there which present you with the opportunity to grow in your discipleship and join Jesus in his manifesto to seek and save the lost. The first is CAP, Christian Action Against Poverty. Christian Action Against Poverty. That's the first ministry. Now, some of you, if not all of you, are aware of who CAP are. Okay? It's a great story. A man called John Kirkby, who's the founder of CAP. Okay? It very much aligns with Jesus' manifesto. Okay? They've got different ministries under the umbrella. I was actually, I'm a trained job CAP job coach. Okay? Uh, you've got the debt center. You've got people that are struggling with addiction. Loads of different ministries. But if you look at the debt center... Okay, for example, the aim of the debt center is to help people to become debt free. But what I love about John Kirkby was he wasn't going to dilute or shy away from the gospel. Because it's also about seeing people come to know Jesus. And so there's a proclamation of the gospel. And I'm very happy that Frampton, we've been, have, we've been running a debt center for many, many years. And that started from hearing John Kirkby speak and a very elderly couple stand up and talk about how they were about to commit suicide. And they came into contact with Cap. And they were there to tell the story. They're debt-free and they're Christians. It's wonderful. And over the years of it being run, run at, at Frampton, people have become debt-free and some have become Christians. Not all, but some. So it's a wonderful ministry. The second one is Ascension Trust. Okay, I met with the chief operating officer a few weeks ago. Okay? They have some great ministries as well. I was learning lots about them. There's one which is called Bridge Watch. I don't know if you're aware, but many people commit suicide. They jump off bridges. We've got six London bridges. So what they do is they have people, Christians, volunteers, who are basically patrolling those bridges, looking and discerning whether they see anybody at risk of doing that, and then they will intervene. Okay? So that's what they do. Yeah? And I love that. I love, what I love about that ministry again, it's what is it doing? It's aligned with Jesus' manifesto. Seeking and saving the lost. Helping those who are oppressed. 
those who are literally about to commit suicide. So I praise God for those two ministries. There's others as well, which we can get involved in. If we want to, and we should want to, see those awful stats change, if we want to, church, I believe we're going to have to, we are going to have to make some changes. This is my feeling. Now, I'm involved in two ministries, one more so, and that is the rooftop, who I've been mentioning. The second is very much in its infantry stages, and that's called Unshakable 360, which is focused on young adults. Okay? It's, it's going to be an online Christian community, and the idea is but my heart for both of these. I don't know if that one's going to happen, but that's kind of my thinking. I'm looking into it. But my heart for both of these is to basically make disciples who make disciples. Because I can tell you now, between the ages, and Paul will know this, between the ages of 18 and 30 or 35, there's a lot of young Christians who grow up in church and they disconnect. And that's because they deconstruct their faith primarily on their own, or worse still, with their unbelieving friends. Okay? And they don't have that Christian lens or focus injected into it. So they, they, they disconnect. And they walk away from the faith. And that, that to me is sad. Something's got to be done about that. Do you understand? So, uh, and I know Kyle is doing a wonderful job. I respect Paul because he stepped out of the tradition and said, I'm going to do something different. And that's what Kyle is about. And he did it way back then. And that's what we need. We need to be looking at ways in which we can connect with the culture, with the people around us. I am happy as well to speak to the church leader, the appointed person, about the rooftop process. It is really a good process. And it's very simple. It's 12 sessions. Okay? And the focus is really on those three different components, which I mentioned. Prayer. But a prayer which aligns our hearts with Jesus. Because that's what we want. We need to be part of his mission. And in that process, having a radical encounter... Where, the, where there's a, an epiphany, there's a revelation, there's an awakening, just like what happened to Peter. And then we must never forget, the next most important thing is we move out. Every day we should be, whatever we're doing, we should be trying to discern, God, what are you doing here? Why have you put this person on my path? What's going on? What do you want me to do? How, are we gonna, where, how do we work together on this, Jesus? This is what we should be doing as, as disciples. This is what discipleship is. And like I say, I'm happy to have a discussion. I'm even happy. I'm looking for a few pilots. I've only just stepped into the role of the UK pioneer. So I'm happy to, to work alongside some churches initially to see through this process, to see if it can spark some change, to help us to be the, the Christians who Christ has called us to be and to reflect the type of discipleship that we see in the Gospels and beyond. i finish with this. It's time for us to roll up our sleeves. Jesus is, is going to come again. We can't, we can't just sit here thinking it's not going to happen on our watch. Time is against us. Time is truly against us. Jesus is going to come back again, brothers and sisters. And, and, and it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> I can't tell you how grateful I am to Christ because I was truly in the mud and mire. And I still am. To a degree, I'm not, we're not the finished article, guys. Yeah? We're, 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 we've been saved. We're being saved. So we're still work in progress. So it's time to roll up our sleeves. Because after all, Jesus really is, which another verse I saw earlier, the way, the truth, and the life. No one can go to the Father except through him. Amen? Let me just quickly pray. Father, we praise your holy name. We thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. You are such a wonderful Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, our Savior, our bridge to the Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you would enter into my ugly heart and into the brokenness and ugliness within humanity in order for us to realize that we are image bearers of God. We pray that you help us. Help us to be 
the people you have called us to be. We know there's lots of competing voices, some of which within. But we know that you're a great, big, huge God and you are the way maker, miracle worker. We want to see this nation change, Lord. We want those stats to change. And it, it may feel like a daunting task, but all things are possible with you. Bless my brothers and sisters. Thank you for the privilege of being able to share that which you put in my heart. In Jesus' name, amen.